my this show i'm going to demonstrate that movement and aspiration should actually go together to increase our ability to detect large vessels prior to injecting there's an increasing trend to advocate moving the needle during injection instead of aspirating despite aspirating having what i believe is the most measurable impact on safety of any safety step in this week's show i'm going to show you a new safety step which you can do to increase safety and demonstrate that it really does detect intravascular passage of the needle. Many opponents of aspirating do not analyze the benefits of aspirating as you should as a screening test. They constantly focus on the false negatives and the false positives to dismiss the entire idea. They actually ignore the proven incidence of true positives and what that actually means for patients. Put simply, a positive aspirate is the only cheap and accessible way that you can detect the most dangerous situation in medical aesthetics, the placement of an injecting needle in the lumen of a vessel. Critics will then incorrectly claim that any movement, no matter how small, will invalidate this information, which would only be true if blood vessels were infinitely small. At the heart of this is the self-evident claim that a syringe filling with blood clearly has a strong correlation with the presence of blood vessels. And this information allows you to change your course of action prior to the point of no return. But what if movement itself could actually provide you with more information than a static aspiration and injection? In this example, you can see me priming a filler needle, placing it into the gel, and then aspirating to create a negative pressure. For years, I have noticed that occasionally positive aspirations would occur after small movements of the needle. And it makes sense that they would. So when you aspirate, you create a negative pressure at the tip of the needle. When you're in the tissue, there is no way to alleviate that negative pressure until you pass into a blood vessel, where the pressure is then alleviated by blood moving up into the syringe. So we get that information as a way of detecting the presence of blood vessels in the path of the needle. Now, it has already been proven in many experiments that primed needles allow the detection of this very risky situation, the needle inside a lumen. This does not need to be perfect to be extremely valuable, since detecting intraluminal passage through a large vessel is the one situation that we fear most. A 30 to 80% reduction in risk is freely available to those who decide to take the time to understand the mathematics of screening and probabilities. Aspirating is not a black and white answer to the question, am I in a vessel? But it is the answer to a question, what is the probability that I am near a large vessel? And it's a better way to find this information out than anything short of doing everything under ultrasound. So let's take a look at how combining movement and aspirating actually works. Inject as I might, all the way down through a blood vessel which I wouldn't be able to see in normal life. Aspirate, and then come out along the track of the needle. And as you can see, there's a positive as I pass through that. That would tell me about the presence of this vessel before I start my bobbing up and down injecting without aspirating. So let's talk over some of this in a bit more detail where I'm gonna get my team to ask me some questions to help make sense of what is actually a relatively complex set of ideas. So negative pressure, in order for aspirating to work, you're relying on a pressure gradient you create a negative pressure in the syringe, and that then is greater than the pressure in the blood vessel. Obviously blood is liquid, and it causes the transfer of liquid blood into the syringe so that you can see it. The problem with negative pressure is it does other things too. So if you're sucking against tissue or it can suck vessels closed uh, if you suck too hard. Um, and so negative pressure isn't, isn't always a guarantee that you'll get a transfer of liquid, but it's, it is the requirement. Like you have to have some negative pressure. And what I'm going to show in this experiment is how the, the negative pressure is held while you move the needle. Because that's the key thing in this little mini demonstration is that while you're moving, the negative pressure stays. So if you pass into the passage of a blood vessel, you will get a flashback on many occasions telling you that you're near a big vessel and not to continue injecting. So the, the core concept with moving the needle is that you're spreading risk. You're actually not reducing risk. You're spreading it. And that might reduce the, the seriousness of a vascular occlusion. So it's not saying you're going to get fewer vascular occlusions. In fact, it's actually saying you're going to get more vascular occlusions, but they will be so small that hopefully it won't matter. So that's the underlying principle behind moving the needle, which is what I really like about this idea, is you can have the best of both worlds. We can detect intravascular passage of, of the needle in some instances, and we can also have that benefit of not putting too much in one place. Because I don't think you can argue 
when you understand the difference between frequency and, and seriousness of a vascular occlusion, that moving will reduce the seriousness because you're putting fewer amounts into more places. So it's a, it's a distribution of risk, spreading the risk, not actually decreasing the risk of vessel, blood vessels being injected with filler. It's just that there are fewer, smaller amounts. Here's the potential issue with a moving needle, which is that if, you're, if you go through a, a vessel and you're injecting all the way in and all the way out the path, then you could block a vessel. It doesn't take a huge amount to block a vessel. 0 0.05 mils will do it. You may get away with that if you think it's a small, you know, if it's less than that, it's a small vascular occlusion. But what if you were to aspirate and check the path of that needle before you inject? Because placement of filler here might cause a problem. Whereas if you detect that vessel, you can go down the path you want to go with the needle. So we go all the way through. We go through this vessel, which we wouldn't be able to see in real life. Aspirate and then check the path of that needle before you go on it and look what happens. You get a flashback as you're coming through. So this would be a reasonable thing to do. Check the path of the needle and then go back in and inject. If you didn't get a flashback, you could then inject in that path more safely. So that's the core principle which I agree with. Now I'm suggesting we stack another thing on top, which is that we aspirate and detect intravascular placement because that lowers your risk even more. In terms of what I mean by the lumen, this is simply the, the hole that the blood travels down. So it's the empty space inside a blood vessel. And as a needle passes through the lumen, that's when you'll get a negative pressure gradient between the vessel and the syringe, and it'll be equalized by the blood rushing up and you'll see a flashback of blood and you'll know that you've passed through a vessel, which means you know that there is a vessel in the path of your needle, which gives you information you can use before you inject. <music>